Good morning. This is a hearing uh, entitled Examining the Impact of Obamacare on Doctors and Patients. The committee will come to order. I will recognize uh, myself for the purpose of making an opening statement and then the ranking member, the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, good morning again and thank you for being here. The recent Supreme Court decision focuses anew our attention on health care and the role of government therein. People are rightfully concerned about the how the rising cost of health care is crowding out other financial priorities for their families. However, in the ongoing debate over increasing health care costs and taxes, we will do well to study the impact on doctors and patients. Today we will examine an often neglected but very relevant aspect of the Affordable Care Act. We will hear from doctors whose primary concern is that the Affordable Care Act significantly increases government's role in health care. For example, the law creates 159 new agencies, boards, and committees to control how physicians do their jobs. Additionally, the Affordable Care Act has already generated over 12,000 pages in regulations and administrative requirements that only serve to distract and delay a doctor's primary objective, which is to provide care to patients. Furthermore, these requirements disproportionately hurt small practice doctors. The most, since larger practices have more leverage with insurance companies and larger staff to handle the burden of an ever increasing paperwork. According to the American Association of Medical Colleges, America will experience a doctor shortage of 124,000 to 159,000 physicians by 2025. Compounding this problem will be a surge in demand. The Affordable Care Act spends nearly $2 trillion subsidizing health insurance over the next decade. The result of this new spending will be a massive increase in the demand for health care services, which will inevitably mean longer wait times for appointments and less time doctors are able to spend with each patient. Without fundamental reform, our Nation's health care infrastructure will not be able to handle this surge in demand. The problem of access to care is especially troubling for participants in government programs, namely for those on Medicaid and Medicare. The Affordable Care Act increases Medicaid enrollment by nearly 20 million Americans. Medicaid is already in dire need of reform. It is too large and complicated to effectively serve its patients. In fact, it is so overburdened right now, less than half of all physicians accept new Medicaid patients because of the low payment rates, and high administrative cost. Under the new health care law, enrollees will continue to overwhelm emergency rooms because of a lack of access to primary care physicians. The Affordable Care Act is also bad for seniors on Medicare. First, the law cuts Medicare Advantage, reducing choices for seniors. Secondly, the law cuts overall Medicare spending by $500 billion over the next decade and uses these savings for new government spending. In fact, these effects are so disparaging that the chief actuary at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services believes the cuts to Medicare will lead to 15 percent of providers closing their doors by the end of the decade. At point of personal uh, digression and in the interest of full disclosure, uh, my father was a physician. Uh, I suspect uh, it is best to characterize him as still being a physician. He just doesn't practice medicine anymore. I remember when I was a kid, he was paid in vegetables. He was paid by people who would cut the grass at our home in exchange for him taking care of their children because they couldn't pay in cash, uh, some of which is now illegal. He never refused to see anyone, regardless of their ability to pay. And he didn't need the government telling him that it was the right thing to do. He did it because medicine was and is a noble profession. It is a helping profession. Regrettably, it now looks more like a business. I have scores of friends back home who are doctors, which is unusual for a lawyer, but nonetheless, I do. And I don't know a single one who would recommend to his or her kids that they pursue a career in medicine. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the Affordable Care Act's impact on doctors' ability to effectively practice medicine and the key challenges they face from the law. 
Instead of retroactively addressing the impediments to the Affordable Care Act, it is my hope that this hearing will aid the Committee in its efforts to move forward in implementing genuine health care reform, reform that is backed by doctors, that empowers patients, and that lowers health care costs for everyone. With that, I would recognize the Ranking Member, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say that, you know, I think that people like your father were absolute jewels. They were the salt of the earth, pillars of the universe. As a matter of fact, I encountered a few of them where I grew up. There was one doctor in our county, and uh, Dr. Crandall, and uh, you couldn't get a better physician than he was. Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for calling this hearing. And let me state up front that I believe that health care should be a right and not a privilege afforded to just a few. And I am absolutely and firmly convinced that because of the Affordable Health Care Act, millions of Americans will live better longer, healthier, and higher quality lives. Now that the United States Supreme Court has held the law to be constitutional, millions of Americans can know that their health coverage is on the way and that it is here to stay. I must confess that I am somewhat mystified by what the majority thinks it is doing. Today, the Republican leadership scheduled the House to begin debate on a bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act. This will be the 31st time that House Republicans voted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, and it will be the 31st time it will not be repealed. Today's subcommittee hearing purports to examine the efforts of doctors and patients. But for a serious discussion of the impact of mandated care on doctors and patients, we need to look no further than Massachusetts. Since 2006, Massachusetts, under Governor Romney, mandated near universal coverage for its population. Curiously, the majority did not invite a single doctor or patient from Massachusetts to share their experiences. In fact, the majority invited no patients at all. The lone patient representative invited today was chosen by the Democrats of the committee. The majority has granted us only one witness. Why are there no physicians on the panel from the only State in the Union with mandated care? Perhaps it is because the majority know that you do not hear complaints from physicians there. In fact, polls show that Massachusetts doctors in large numbers support the health care law. The New England Journal of Medicine published a poll recently conducted by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of over 2,000 doctors, and 88 percent believe the reforms improved or did not affect negatively the quality of patient care in Massachusetts. So in order to complete the record today, I am supplementing the hearing record with actual testimonials from Massachusetts doctors. Many Americans are already benefiting from the protections provided to patients in the ACA. Eighty-six million Americans have free preventive care. Six point six million college students remain on their parents' insurance policies. One hundred and five million Americans have no lifetime coverage limits and 16 million are no longer vulnerable to rescission of insurance coverage after precipitated health events. For doctors, the ACA provides grants to States to increase the health care workforce. There are incentives for primary care physicians, nurses, and health care practitioners, and doctors do not, are no longer saddled with debt from uninsured patients. I want the American public to know that Massachusetts doctors firmly believe the bill has gone through thousands of hours, and they believe that the doctors there think it is necessary, that it is beneficial, and that it is helpful. 
So today we will hear from physicians who have not had the same experiences as the doctors in Massachusetts. But I certainly thank you for the hearing and thank the witnesses for their participation. Thank the gentleman from Illinois. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. It is now uh, our pleasure. Mr. To Chairman? Welcome. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. If I could seek recognition for one minute. Uh, without objection. I, object, I appreciate that. I, uh, uh, listening to the ranking member, I, I do have to comment that when Obamacare was being rammed down the throat of the minorities, we were denied any witnesses. When Obamacare was being put together in the dark of night without Republicans in the room or even the public in the room, we were denied all activity. In fact, when the Speaker said we will have to pass it to find out what is in it, we knew exactly what we were in for, something that purported not to be a tax and then had to be distorted into being a tax in order to uh, uh, pass constitutional master. So as the ranking member said, yes, the Supreme Court has spoken. And yes, with 12,000 new pages and growing of, uh, of additional bureaucracy and requirements and costs going up logarithmically, the gentleman, in fact, is correct that maybe no one is complaining in Massachusetts, a State with only 4 percent at the time of the enactment uninsured, but the Nation and my State with over 16 percent uninsured finds itself with no cost controls, Medicaid, a very ineffective program from a cost containment standpoint, and other programs driving up the cost, while in fact driving out doctors from practicing and people like the Chairman's father are choosing to retire rather than live under Obamacare. So I certainly hope that the ranking member, when he complains about the one witness, which is the custom, would try to remember that under Chairman Towns, the minority was given no witnesses repeatedly, and Obamacare was not even offered for this committee to have an opportunity under the previous chairman. And I thank the gentleman and yield back. Of course, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say that I certainly appreciate your comments. But you know, I remember my mother telling us when I was growing up that right is right if nobody is right, and wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. Thank you. Well, I am glad to hear that you realize that you were all wrong. Yield back. Uh, I was uh, a little premature in, uh, uh, in beginning to introduce our panel of witnesses. Uh, we will recognize the Vice Chairman, the, the uh, gentleman, uh, the doctor from Arizona, and then the gentleman from uh, Missouri for opening statements as well, Dr. Gozar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing today. We certainly appreciate it, and thanks for all the distinguished witnesses. Uh, I want to offer a special uh, welcome to Dr. Eric Novak um, from the State of Arizona. Um, we have an absolute privilege, Eric, for all you have done for Arizona, the patient-doctor relationship, um, and across the country. So thank you so very, very much. It was great seeing you tra traverse Arizona all those times. You know, we need a patient-centered reform, not reform dictated to every doctor's office in the country from bureaucrats. In fact, as a dentist for over 25 years in private practice before coming here to Congress, most of the symptoms of our ailing health care system come down to one root cause, the fracturing of the doctor-patient relationship. When President Obama set out to pass the health care reform package, he promised doctors that little would change for them in their practices and that the folks who didn't have insurance would now have it. Today's hearing will examine the ways in which this promise has rung false. The President's health care law is full of reporting requirements and regulations for practicing physicians. It stands to reason that the larger practices or hospitals will have greater leverage to handle these requirements than a sole practitioner. Physicians in my district are worried that the private practice model will erode and eventually be unsustainable. Such a development would be devastating to the practice of medicine. The law also contains over 100 new boards, panels, and groups of bureaucrats to manage and dictate health care decisions and gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services unprecedented authority to dictate standards of care across the country. Imagine a Washington bureaucrat sitting with you in the doctor's office as you are examined, as you discuss delicate issues concerning your health. That is the effect that this law will have on the doctor-patient relationship. Furthermore, the proposed expansion of an unreformed broken Medicaid system will be unmitigated disaster. What good is expanding Medicaid if the program is such a bad deal for providers? 
that a Medicaid card isn't worth the paper it's printed on. When I was a dentist practicing in a low-income area of, rural, of a rural community, I found that I was better uh, to deliver care to people of all incomes and ages when I took the Medicaid system out of the equation entirely. We need to come together as a nation and find ways to lower the cost of health care for the young, the old, the healthy, and the sick, not pursue party-line legislation that enriches bureaucrats and special interests at the expense of our health care system. Let's reinnervate re the, the doctor-patient re relationship with a patient-centered, patient-friendly health care system. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman from Arizona. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you for conducting this hearing. And um, in, in response to uh, the last two speakers on your side, uh, Chairman Issa, as well as uh, Dr. Swigert, I think it would have been relevant uh, if we could have had um, a, a doctor from Massachusetts uh, to be a part of, of this hearing. You know, their, their views would have been uh, uh, relevant since for the past five years they have been living with comprehensive health care reform uh, signed into law by Governor Mitt Romney that is substantially similar to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but the Democratic staff gathered testimonials of numerous Massachusetts physicians relating to their experience and the impact upon their patients. And let me share just a few of them. From a Boston cardiologist, he, uh, I, I quote him, I never felt more confident than my patients and I together are making the best decisions for them without influence of outside agents. Another Boston primary care physician, quote, before health reform, my patient was not able to see a physician and tried to avoid care except in the case of emergency. Now, I or a colleague can see her for both preventative and urgent care since insurance is within her reach. A physician from Brookline, Massachusetts states, Instead of worrying about getting paid for each individual visit, we reach out to patients to prevent repeat office visits, hospitalizations, and deteriorations. My patients feel cared for, and I know they are receiving better evidence-based care. So, so there are benefits uh, to a law like the Affordable Care Act. Uh, when you look at how the insurance in industry has come on board and voluntarily seen some of the benefits in this, it, it speaks volumes about how this law will help hundreds of millions of Americans. And it also speaks volumes about the majority in this House who has decided that they want to repeal this law, uh, and, and it kind of defines where we're going with this debate, that we are, are going to divide this country between the haves and the have-nots, uh, and that this is a class struggle. If you're fortunate enough to be able to afford health insurance, uh, then it's okay. You can take care of yourself. But if you're not, you're on your own, or if you have a job that doesn't provide you with health care coverage, then too bad. And I, and I think we're, we're a better nation than that, Mr. Chairman, and we should try to uh, um, follow that example in this institution. Uh, and with that, I yield back and look forward to the witnesses' testimony. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. It is now our pleasure to welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses. I will introduce you from your right to left, my left to right, and then we will recognize you for your opening statement in the same manner. Dr. Jeff uh, Collier is a physician and the Lieutenant Governor for the great state of Kansas. Dr. Richard Armstrong is a physician in Michigan and Chief Operating Officer of Docs for Patient Care. Mr. Ron Polak is Founding Executive Director of Families USA. Ms. Sally Pipes is President and CEO of the Pacific Research Institute. Mr. Kelvin Cullimore, Jr. is Chairman, President, and CEO of uh, Dynatronics, a medical device manufacturer. Dr. Eric Novak is an orthopedic surgeon 
at Phoenix Orthopedic Consultants. Uh, apologies if I mispronounced uh, anyone's name. The lights that you will see mean what they traditionally mean in life. Green means go. Yellow means uh, go as fast as you can and try to get under the red light. And red means stop. So with that, we will uh, recognize the distinguished Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Collier. Thank you, Chairman Gowdy. Uh, ranking uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The witness is being sworn. Uh, I, you are correct per usual. Uh, it is the uh, policy of our committee to swear uh, all w uh, witnesses. I would ask that you please rise and lift your right hands and repeat after me. Or don't repeat after me, just affirm or not affirm. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you. You may be uh, seated. Again, please limit your testimony to the extent that you are able to do so to five minutes. And, and keeping in mind, your entire statement will be made part of the record. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would recognize the Lieutenant Governor from Kansas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Davis and, and Chairman Issa and members of the subcommittee. Um, my name is Dr. Jeff Collier. Uh, as a practicing surgeon, as Lieutenant Governor of Kansas, I care fiercely about my patients. They need real results. I had an interesting experience. Twenty-five years ago, I was part of a team writing on Soviet military spending. The Soviets claimed that they spent about one-fifth what the United States did to produce a fantastic array of tanks, <coughs> planes, and millions of men under arms, many times more than the United States. But under the Soviet-style central planning, prices and costs had no relationship to production and real expenses. And to get around that economic reality, they created a massive bureaucracy to ensure results. And it failed. I have learned that my patients, whether they have insurance or not, are economically rational. We have bureaucratized health care so much that it distorts health outcomes and pricing. And as I describe in my written testimony, health bureaucracy misaligns our basic price signals and economic forces that would actually help my patients and consumers. For example, in my own practice, two-thirds of my employees are dealing with the bureaucracy, while only one-third of them are dealing with direct patient care. And so we can do a better job, and we have some lessons to learn if we use real economic principles. One example is Kansas Medicaid. About a decade ago, previous administrations in Kansas tried a Massachusetts-style reform. They decided to cut our relatively low uninsured rate by dramatically expanding the Medicaid program. In those days, our uninsured rate was about 10 percent. Commercial insurance covered 70 percent, and government programs were about 20 percent. Ten years later, commercial insurance has collapsed. 59 percent of people are in commercial insurance government programs have expanded dramatically, and guess what? The number of uninsured has actually ticked up. Those are exactly the wrong trend lines. So without flexibility and with these mandated maintenance of effort requirements, Kansas' Medicaid budget has now ballooned from $2.4 billion to $3 billion. To deal with these cost increases, previous administrations decided to increase taxes. They cut provider rates. They refused dental benefits. They created long waiting lists and even told Kansans if they are over the age of 18, they are not eligible for a heart transplant. Those bureaucratic savings certainly did nothing to improve patient outcomes. States have a better way. When Governor Brownback and I took office in January of 2011, Kansas faced a $500 million deficit, largely due to Medicaid. Furthermore, the Medicaid program was in disarray. It was scattered across four cabinet agencies without a common budget, without common health goals. Governor Brownback and I made an important decision. Rather than cut people off or make massive across-the-board cuts, we would try to remake Medicaid to be more consumer-oriented and provide integrated care. Two weeks ago, Kansas signed three contracts to provide integrated care for needy Kansans. And in those contracts, we specifically insisted on no rate cuts for providers and that no one who is eligible for Medicaid would be thrown off. We estimated that we might save about $800 million. But the signed contracts actually turned out better than our original estimates. Every Kansan in, on Medicaid can keep their participating doctor. 
They will have at least three choices of different health plans and offer benefits like opportunity accounts and personalized health programs. Our projected savings are now $1 billion, and we added additional services like preventive dental coverage, coverage for heart transplants, bariatric services for obesity, and we created an off-ramp from Medicaid to get people back into the stable commercial insurance market. And to make sure that we achieve these health outcomes that we are after, we are actually going to hold back a half a billion dollars from Medicaid providers to get real results for real Kansans. In other words, if you let the States make those decisions on a local level, we can actually set and achieve real health outcomes and not cut providers and not throw people off of programs. And we can actually increase benefits. Of course, all of this depends on CMS approval, which we are still waiting for. It is clear that a global waiver tied to health outcomes would more effectively allow States to deal with these issues. Private insurance has decreased dramatically in the State of Kansas. Our child-only plans were cut from four plans to just two counties with one single plan. We have seen premiums increase dramatically. There is a better way, and that is to let the States do this. We are working on Kansas solutions, and we appreciate the opportunity to share those with you and to work with other States. Thank you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. Dr. Armstrong. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to speak with you today on behalf of Docs for Patient Care and thousands of practicing physicians nationwide who share our deep concern about the effects of the Affordable Care Act upon the practice of medicine and specifically upon our relationship with patients. You have my written testimony and the attached information. In the interest of time, I will depart from the written documents. In response to the question, how does this law affect the physician-patient relationship? The answer is, it destroys it. This has been developing for many years, but this law truly makes it crystal clear. In fact, Dr. Donald Berwick, the former head of CMS, has written that for this law to work, the traditional physician-patient dyad must end. All of you on this committee see your doctor from time to time. What do you expect from the visit? You would like a friendly, compassionate doctor who will listen to you, examine you, and talk to you. The doctor will call on extensive training and experience to devise a plan that you both agree upon and understand. Your doctor simply wants to do what their training and experience has prepared them to do, listen to your history, do a physical exam, discuss the findings, and recommend a plan. Unfortunately, that is not how things are going in medicine. To illustrate how these things are changing, I would like to share some stories. The electronic medical records systems have been touted as a cure for many of the problems in our health care systems today. Unproven and untested, these claims are simply not true. During a recent sales demonstration at my hospital, the presenter, a physician's assistant, took 30 minutes to demonstrate how to document the patient encounter in their system. The process was unfriendly to both patient and doctor. One of our primary care physicians asked, how do you propose that I do this in the 15 minutes that I have with patients? He answered, the goal is to reach at least a level three visit. I will say that again. The goal is to reach at least a level three visit. In other words, billing trumps medical care. He added, so you have your nurse enter the history data, you fill in the physical exam, make the plan, and move on to the next patient. Really? Where in these 15 minutes do you talk to the patient or listen to the patient? You, the doctor. As a patient, how do you feel? Did you develop a relationship, or are you part of an assembly line? I think that most of us know the answer, and it should make us both sad and angry. And then there is this account of a fellow physician's recent experience taking her father to visit his new primary care doctor. This is her story. I took my father, 80 years old and living independently, to meet his new internal medicine physician yesterday. I sent ahead a brief summary of the history, list of medications, and request that he do a physical exam. Since it had been well over three years since it was done, 
After introducing himself, he immediately announced that federal guidelines no longer allow regular exams. An exam allows only listening to heart, lungs, and bowel sounds with the patient sitting. It does nothing else unless there is a specific complaint to justify it. I asked if anemia, which my father has, justified a rectal exam. He said no. He, of course, quoted repeatedly the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendations as one of the standards. He recited the statistics and the societal cost arguments. He had it all down, a perfectly useful idiot. He said he only does evidence-based medicine. In fact, he had just been to a conference to confirm the validity of his positions. I did not engage him. It was not appropriate with my poor father sitting there listening to how he is too old for, well, anything. Eventually, to pacify me, the doctor went through the motions of the rectal exam after having to leave the exam room to get gloves and lubricant, which are, of course, of no use to him. I doubt he even knows how to do a rectal exam, since my dad, who has had many of them, hardly felt it. Again, guidelines trump medical care. This is the reality of Obamacare. There is no care. This law, supported by organized medicine, has been consistently opposed by Docs for Patient Care and AAPS. Things don't need to be this way, ladies and gentlemen. This doesn't have to occur. American physicians need to be free to do what they have been trained to do, excel at practicing medicine. American patients need to be free to choose the health insurance plans and medical treatments that suit their needs, not something coerced by a central authority. This is simply impossible under the suffocating burden of the Affordable Care Act. Thank you very much for your invitation to speak today, and I will be happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, Mr. Pollack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanking, thank you, Ranking Member Davis and members of the panel. I am delighted to join and serve as ballast for the five other uh, members of this panel. You know, one of the questions obviously uh, being asked here at this hearing is what does uh, the medical profession think about the Affordable Care Act? I think we have a pretty clear answer from the groups that have expressed their support for the Affordable Care Act, starting with the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association of Family Physicians, the American College of Physicians, that is the umbrella of all internal medicine groups, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, uh, groups like Doctors for America, National Physicians Alliance, and the American Nurses Association. But with respect to uh, patients, we also have a pretty clear example of how patients feel that the Affordable Care Act will serve a positive role. Groups like AARP, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, the American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, Consumers Union, uh, the National MS Society, uh, and many others. And why is it? It is because the Affordable Care Act provides patients with peace of mind and security, security and peace of mind that health care will be there for them when they need it. For example, no longer can insurance companies deny coverage to somebody like a child with asthma or diabetes simply because that child has a preexisting condition. Why would we want to repeal that protection? The Affordable Care Act rescinds the rules that insurers have followed that they terminate coverage when somebody is sick or has an accident. Why would we want to repeal that protection? The Affordable Care Act prohibits insurers from charging discriminatory premiums based on health status. Why would we want to repeal that protection? It prevents insurers from establishing arbitrary annual and lifetime limits in what is paid out when somebody has a major illness or an accident. Why would we want to repeal that protection? It stops uh, discriminatory premiums based on gender, uh, as women have to pay more in premiums than men simply because of their agenda. Why would we want to repeal that protection? And at the same time, in addition to providing these protections, it makes health coverage more affordable. 
It provides tax credit premium subsidies for middle class and working families that will go to tens of millions of people so that health coverage would be more affordable. Why would we want to repeal that and increase the tax burden on middle class and working families? It provides tax credit subsidies for small businesses so they can better afford providing health coverage for their workers. Currently, a 35 percent tax credit. In 2014, it will go up to 50 percent. Why would we want to hurt small businesses by repealing that? For seniors, it provides a significant benefit. It closes the big coverage gap with, with respect to prescription drugs, the so-called donut hole. Why would we want to continue that big gap in coverage and see it grow with each passing year? It provides seniors with pre free preventive care services so they don't have to pay deductibles and copays for annual physicals, mammograms, and cancer screenings. Why would we want to stop that? And it provides for healthier communities because it provides funding to increase the number of primary care doctors, nurses, long-term care providers, community health centers. It establishes school-based health centers. Uh, so it will increase the number of primary care doctors to serve patients. And I should add that with respect to Massachusetts, as a couple of you, uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Clay, have indicated, the experience in Massachusetts has been terrific. Uninsured rate has dropped in half, while the rest of the country, the uninsured rate has grown. Employer coverage is stable. People are receiving more preventive care. Uh, they have a usual source of care. There is less uh, care provided in emergency rooms. And as I think Mr. Clay indicated, 88 percent of the physicians in Massachusetts say it has either improved quality or it hasn't diminished it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pollack. Uh, Ms. Pipes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, I would like to thank you for inviting me to testify here today. I am going to focus on the impact of the Affordable Care Act on patients. The latest Rasmussen poll, by the way, shows that 54 percent of Americans would still like to see this legislation repealed. Everyone agrees we all want affordable, accessible, quality care. The question is, how do we achieve that goal? There are two competing visions when it comes to answering that question. One focuses on empowering doctors and patients. The other focuses on expanding the role of government in our health care system. This latter vision is the vision of President Obama. It is my belief that his ultimate goal is to move us all into a single-payer Medicare for All system. The President's two main goals were universal coverage and bending the cost curve down. On universal coverage, it is expected that 34 million out of 50.2 million Americans will become insured beginning in 2014. Approximately 18 million will be added to Medicaid, with about another 16 million receiving subsidies from the government. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated, though, that by 2021, 23 million Americans will still be uninsured. This is not universal coverage. It is also important to note that just because a person does not have health insurance, they do not get health care. Under the federal law, EMTALA, anyone can turn up at an emergency room and receive treatment, and they can also pay out of pocket to the doctor or hospital. As to cost, the U.S. spent 17.9 percent of gross domestic product, one-sixth of our economy, on health care. An article in Health Affairs recently said that by 2020, we will be spending 20 percent, one-fifth of our economy, on health care. The ACA will not achieve the goal of lowering the cost of health care. Spending in the U.S. is often compared to spending in Canada, the country where I am from. Canada spends 11.4 percent of gross domestic product on health care. The question is, how do they accomplish that? Well, the government took over the health care system in the 70s. The government sets a global budget of what they are going to spend on health care. As a result, you have ration care, long waiting lists for care, and lack of access to the latest treatments. Take the case of my own mother. In June 2005, my mother felt that she had colon cancer. 
So I suggested she make an appointment with her primary care doctor, which she did. Her doctor said he, she didn't have colon cancer, but he did order an X-ray, which she got. When she called me, I said, you do not detect colon cancer with an X-ray. You need a colonoscopy. And so she went back to her doctor and said, my daughter says I need a colonoscopy. Her doctor said, unfortunately, as a senior, you will not be able to get a colonoscopy. There are too many younger people waiting for treatment. My mother, um, by November, had lost 30 pounds and she started to hemorrhage. My mother went to the emergency room in an ambulance. She spent two days there at Vancouver General Hospital. She spent two days in the transit lounge waiting for a bed in a ward. My mother got her colonoscopy and she passed away two weeks later from metastasized colon cancer. By denying or rationing care, it is possible to keep costs down, but it does not bode well for the patient's future health. Under the Affordable Care Act, it is inevitable that in order to keep costs down, care will be rationed and patients will suffer. The President wanted a health care bill that cost $900 billion over 10 years. The CBO has recently said the decade 2012 to 2022, the cost will be $1.76 trillion. Richard Foster, chief actuary at CMNS, said he did not think that the Affordable <laughs> Care Act would let everyone keep the health insurance that they have if they like it. This goes against the President's oft-repeated statement, if you like your health insurance and you like your doctor, nothing will change. Kaiser Family Foundation showed that from, 2011 to, from 2010 to 2011, the average premium for family plans went up 9 percent, up to $15,073. In the previous year, they only went up 3 percent. Under the employer mandate, starting in 2014, any employer with 50 or more employees who drops coverage will have to pay a fine of $2,000. I believe that a number of employers, the CBO said up to $20 million, will lose their employer-based coverage. So much for the President's statement. America needs a health care system that empowers doctors and patients. Only then will we achieve affordable, accessible, quality care. The question is, who do you want to be in charge of your health care? An HMO bureaucrat, a government bureaucrat, or do you yourself want to be in charge? Universal choice is the key to universal coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Dr. Novak. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this hearing today. Uh, I would preface my comments by mentioning, in response to Mr. Pollack, that uh, the AARP recently revealed that their actual membership were getting phone calls and emails 14 to 1 against the Affordable Care Act during the process. Uh, and so that kind of information does bring a bit into question whether or not the organizations that he listed actually have members that actually were in favor of it, as opposed to just the leadership. A system that combines the spending discipline of the Defense Department with all of the accountability of the public education system, that, sadly, is what the President's health care law's legacy is going to be for the country. Patients and families are the losers, and none of you or your families will be immune from the consequences either. I would like to spend the next few minutes highlighting some portions of my submitted testimony. According to the Administration's own researchers, the bottom 70 percent of the health care users in this country, accounting for over 220 million Americans, spent only 11 percent of all health care dollars, or about $290 billion. The bottom 50 percent, 160 million people, spent only 3 percent of all health care dollars, which is $80 billion. The President's health care law does nothing to increase transparency heighten competition or make the health care experience one iota better for these people. Instead, the law imposes mandates of nearly every kind of manageable and creates health insurance exchanges that are by design meant to turn patients and families into bankable commodities for the nearly $2 trillion in direct Washington subsidies to insurers and other corporations is at stake over the next 10 years alone. Our Arizona efforts to work on the issues of transparency and competition have been met with a level of opposition reminiscent of shock and awe. Hospital CEOs, insurance company lobbyists, and even physician representatives essentially stated that pricing in health care is too complicated and that patients are simply not smart enough or sophisticated enough to understand. In my orthopedic surgery practice, I help care for many children who have broken bones from a fall at the park, at school, and even on the trampoline in the backyard. 
For the parents of these children, a system where doctors are competing with one another to provide comprehensive care at a competitive price, a savings of $20, $30, and even $100 would be achievable. While members of this committee might not think of much of that, for my patients, that money pays for gas, food, and new school clothes. The President's health care law, either directly or uh, through government or through insurance hospital company surrogates, is making it harder, not easier, for these children to get access to timely health care, and the studies support it. The administration also shows that there are high utilizers. One percent of the country, which is about three million people, spend 20 percent of all health care dollars, and the top five percent spend 50 percent of all the health care dollars. And while we tend to spend more on health care as we get older, there is little evidence that low health care users necessarily enter the top 5 percent at some time. Rigid cover rules and cookbook treatment plans are bad for patients of all types. I have a patient I have treated for shoulder problems for several years. He also has heart issues and is on the blood thinner. In spite of being considered safer to have a noninvasive colonoscopy, Medicare refuses to pay for that. Faced with little other option, he came off his blood thinner, subsequently had a blood clot, a cardiac arrest. Miraculously, he survived and has done well, though a great preventable cost to the system. Under the President's health care law, as the decision makers move further away from the patient and instead reside in boards of experts, government rule makers, and insurance and hospital administrators, to whom will doctors be listening? American medicine has already begun to shift to a veterinary ethic described by my friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Singer. When you bring your dog or cat to the vet, the doctor listens to the decision maker, the owner, and not the patient, the pet. The pet, of course, cannot decide for itself which treatment course will be undertaken, whether it is teeth cleaning or euthanasia. And within reason, the vet will follow the advice of the decision maker. Doctors are mortal, fallible, and respond to incentives like all others. If the person who pays the bills creates a framework that patients need to be put into category A or treatment B for the doctor to remain compliant, there is little doubt that this is ultimately what is going to happen. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you were generous to ask me to speak about the impact of the health care law on the doctor-patient relationship. That relationship is complex and intertwined with many of the finer points of policy, the economy, and patient autonomy. We need real health care reform that put patients ahead of the special interests who wrote the health care law and who stand to profit substantially from it, both in financial wealth and power. Health care decisions belong to patients and families, not politicians and their pals. That is how you protect and defend the doctor-patient relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Novak. Mr. Cullen Moore. <clears throat> Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Kelvin Cullimore. I am the President and CEO of Dynatronics Corporation, which is headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, with manufacturing also in Chattanooga, Tennessee. <clears throat> we are a publicly traded company engaged in the manufacture and distribution of medical devices and products primarily for physical therapy and sports medicine applications and provide employment for about 180 people. Dynatronics is a relatively small company with sales of about $32 million, but that is common in this industry. A majority of medical device companies are small companies, approximately 80 percent having 50 or fewer employees. Many are in the early stages of product development with no sales or with sales but no profits. Like many companies, we have been required to implement several rounds of layoffs to cope with difficult economic circumstances of the last few years. If policies such as the 2.3 percent medical device tax included in the Affordable Care Act are implemented, I fear this added burden will not only harm patient care and stifle innovation, but threaten the very existence of companies like Dynatronics. Despite widespread economic challenges, I do consider myself extremely fortunate to be part of a generally vibrant industry that plays a critical role in improving health care and patient care in this country. There are over 2 million hardworking Americans who help make the United States the global leader in medical device technology. Data from the Department of Commerce shows that the medical device industry exported $36 billion of products in 2010 and had a trade surplus of approximately $3.2 billion. Not many segments of the U.S. economy can claim to be a net exporter. It is probably not the first time you have heard this, but I want to be very clear that the United States is in very real danger of losing our global leadership position. If this happens, it will be virtually impossible to get this position back as capital and human resources flow to new centers of innovation outside of our country. The challenges of an uncertain regulatory environment, reimbursement pressures, and, of course, the medical device tax, among others, have created what many describe as a perfect storm. 
I believe this perfect storm could quickly lead to a Class 5 hurricane for patients, providers, and innovators. The Dynatronic story is, in this current environment is not really unique, but it is illustrative of how harmful policies such as the medical device tax are to our ability to improve patient care and drive job creation. Our fiscal year just ended on June 30th. We will report sales in excess of $32 million, but for only the fourth time in 25 years, we will not show a profit. After reporting a pre-tax profit of over $400,000 last year, we will report a pre-tax loss of just under $300,000 for this fiscal year. In other words, despite not earning a penny in profits this year, the Affordable Care Act will require that we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in a device tax. Quite simply, a company such as ours and thousands of others that are similarly struggling or have not yet crested the hill of profitability as a startup company will have a very difficult decision to make in addressing this added tax if it is not repealed. Where do I get the money to pay the tax? Research and development are the easiest short-term cuts, but they lead to less innovation and negatively impact patient care. Do I drop product lines that are marginally profitable that now are no longer profitable due to the tax but still may have benefit to patients? Some would say that we make it up by raising our prices. Pass it along to the end user. Anyone operating in the current environment knows that there is no appetite on the part of hospitals or practitioners to accept price increases of any kind. To the contrary, we are under tremendous pressure to lower prices. Because the tax is levied on sales and not profits, it will take a significant bite out of resources available for innovation and growth regardless of a company's size or stage of development. This hurts patients and providers as the ability and pace at which innovation occurs slows dramatically, reducing improved patient care and quality of life. Many of the most innovative device companies are pre-profit and struggling to achieve sufficient profitability to recover the millions of dollars invested into research, clinical trials, and other development costs, or more importantly, attract the additional capital needed to complete product development. This tax is a huge disincentive to attracting investors. If a company such as Dynatronics decides to address the device tax by making severe cuts to R&D, what I have essentially done is limit the potential for my company to have new technologies and devices in three to five years down the road. I cannot emphasize enough just how delicate the innovation ecosystem is for medical device makers. Any cuts to R&D today will manifest themselves down the road in ways that hurt patients and providers the most. Medical device innovation plays a central role in patient care, but we face many headwinds and need your help to calm those headwinds and enable the United States to maintain our global leadership position. I respectfully request that you recognize the misguided nature of this medical device tax and the effect it will have not only on companies like Dynatronics, but the resulting impact on technological innovation and patient care. Help us avoid this impending hurricane. America's patients, providers, and workers are counting on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cullen Moore. I would uh, ask unanimous consent that our colleagues, uh, Drs. Gingrey, Beneshek, and Fleming, be allowed to participate in today's hearing without objection. So ordered, uh, I would now recognize the distinguished chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, for his questioning, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Later today, we will uh, have a panel of, uh, of business people who will also be uh, before this committee at the full committee level on the same subject. No surprise, we won't have a doctor from Massachusetts. Mr. Pollack, are you a doctor from Massachusetts? No, I'm not. Okay. So the Democrats didn't pick a doctor from Massachusetts to bring in either, did they? I'm not a doctor from Massachusetts. Okay. And uh, when you were mentioning the, uh, uh, the various groups that supported the, uh, the legislation, you, you didn't seem to, and, you, and all the things we wouldn't want to do, you didn't seem to mention one thing that, that I'm concerned about I want each of you to address. Under uh, the ACA or Obamacare, if somebody has 50 employees and doesn't provide care, it's going to cost $2,000, just sort of a shake of heads. Is that true? And if somebody doesn't buy their own insurance, whether they are they're offered it at their uh, company or not, it is going to cost them $2,000 on their tax return. Isn't that true? Not necessarily. It really depends, uh, it depends on sli the condition. A, sli a sliding scale. It depends but if on they make $50,000 in their family, they are going to pay $2,000. It depends on what portion 
of one's income actually is attributed to what one has to pay. Uh, exactly. So it is based on a rather obscure household income for the entire family, not known at the beginning, but in fact a family of four with $50,000 will find themselves with a $2,000 fine if they don't buy it. Uh, but in fact, they won't necessarily know that till the end of the year. So let's let's go through a couple of other uh, similar questions. Uh, if you're an employer and you do provide a health care system under Obamacare, and then you find that one of your employees went to a exchange, which they have a right to do, and did not go through your health care system, even though you have a federally compliant health care system, isn't it true you can be billed back $1,000 from the exchange because an employee with a certain household income chose to do that? For the Lieutenant Governor, are you familiar with that provision? Yes, I am. So included in all this good work is a series of taxes that, in fact, can represent as much as four or $5,000 between the employer and employee, none of which actually goes to the health care. No, no, wait a second. Just, uh, Dr. P or Mr. Pollack, you are going to be asked a lot of questions by the Democrats. That is why they brought you here as an apologist for Obamacare. Uh, but, Dr. Caller, I guess my question is, isn't it true, and I think you can all answer this as yes, even Mr. Pollack, that if an employer cannot afford to offer health care, but was willing to put $2,000 into the pocket of their employee for health savings or something along that line, but a non-federally compliant system. And the employee has $2,000 that they could put into a health care system. Together they have $4,000. But if they don't buy the $12,000 system they would have to buy, the government will take $4,000 in many cases from the combination of two of them, providing no health care for that $4,000. Lieutenant Governor, isn't that true? Yeah, that is what happens when you take away the flexibility. Okay. So one of the provisions of Obamacare is, in fact, that you can tax, and of course now the Chief Justice has made it clear that I guess the Democratic majority in this House with no Republican support could, in fact, tax $2,000 by the, the family and $2,000 by the employer and provide no real solution. Isn't that true? So, Mr. Chairman, one of the things you are missing in the No, no, no. In the Mr. Mr. Pollack, Mr. Pollack, somebody, the, somebody Mr. Pollack, earns Mr. Pollack you can answer a question that is asked as a yes or no, as a yes or no. If you do anything else, what you are really doing is being the Democrats' witness and, and being uh, uh, obstreperous. So if you will if you'll please wait till they ask you a question. In my remaining moments, for the witnesses, other than Mr. Pollack, will be asked by the Democrats to apologize for Obamacare. Is there anything so far that has occurred as Obamacare is implemented that has reduced cost and thus made health care more affordable for Americans? Not more subsidized, not more taxed. Is there anything that has occurred so far that has made health care less expensive for any of our witnesses? Uh, the, the, answer, the answer is yes. The record will indicate that our witnesses all found it to be a no, and you obviously can, can answer when called on. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cullimore, I just have one question for you. Can you find a single basis, other than scoring a cheap trick in order to say Obamacare didn't cost? Uh, is there a single basis under which you should tax health care inherently, health care products inherently making them more expensive? Other than a cheap trick from members of Congress, was there any basis to tax your products? I am not aware of any. And any basis under which, by taxing them, they don't inherently become more expensive? Uh, that seems basic economics to me. So we have taxed health care, made it more expensive, even in your kind of products, even if you are making no profit at all. And that is what you are finding undeniably under Obamacare. Uh, that is what we are finding. And, and more important than just making it more expensive is it is threatening the ability to do research and development and provide the kinds of tools that our practitioners need to improve patient care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank the gentleman from California. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, unanimous consent to insert into the record testimony from seven physicians who are members of doctors for. Reserving a point of order. 
if, the, if I'd state the point of order, if the gentleman would phrase that as anything other than testimony, re committee rules require that testimony be sworn, this would be unsworn. So if he would call them statements for the record, I would re re withdraw my objection. Statements from the record? I, um, I withdraw. Without objection. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you again. Uh, Dr. Hoyer, what kind of physician are you? I am a plastic and craniofacial um, surgeon in Kansas City. So you are a plastic surgeon? Yes, sir. Uh, are the services that you provide covered by the Affordable Care Act? Yeah. I spent, uh, I spent many days, many nights in the emergency room taking care of people who have had their hands blown off by fireworks injuries, women with breast cancer, and a variety of services. So then you actually you do more than plastic surgery. That is that's, plastic surgery. Yeah, that is your specialty and all of those things associated with it you, you do. Um, let me also ask you, you indicate in your written testimony that we have got to do something quick before irreversible harm is done to our health care delivery system. Could you tell me what irreversible harm is done to the more than 30 million people who for the first time in their lives will have access to health insurance? And could you tell me what irreversible harm is done to those individuals who will for the first time have an opportunity for a private practicing physician? who becomes their primary care, as opposed to the emergency rooms that you just mentioned? Yes, sir. For example, in the State of Kansas, we had four insurers that provided child-only policies. And since the formation of the ACA, those insurers, three of them have pulled out completely. We have one insurer that only covers two out of 105 counties. I, didn't, I doubt that those are going to be coming back anytime well, soon. Could you tell me how those individuals are going to receive care? How they will receive care? Yes. Yeah. In Kansas, doctors do take care of patients. We have a wide array of opportunities through qualified health clinics, through a number of State programs and Federal programs, and also the generosity and the willingness of many physicians to work there. There are solutions that we can deal with these problems and we can add additional things. We are very compassionate. We want to work with them. It is just that one solution mandated from someplace else may not work in Kansas. Mr. Pollack, could you, your organization, Families USA, estimated that across the nation, 26,100 people between the ages of 25 and 64 died prematurely due to a lack of health coverage. And that was from your June 2012 report, Dying for Coverage. Could you describe how lack of health care coverage impacts premature death? Sure. Um, Mr. Ranking Member, um, First, I should say the methodology for this report was developed by the Institute of Medicine, the scientific panel, uh, in, in uh, 2002. But the main way this occurs is that when somebody does not have health care coverage, typically they delay getting care. At the onset of a pain, at the onset of a health problem, People who are uninsured often feel they can't pay for a doctor or to get an exam. And so they delay care. And when they delay care, sometimes the illness gets worse, sometimes it spreads. And unfortunately, about 26,100 people pay the ultimate price because they were uninsured. And one other thing I should say, this also affects people with health insurance. And the reason it does that is when people who are uninsured get care in an emergency room, they usually can't pay for that care, or at least they can't pay for a portion of that. And a hospital has to make up for those costs. And the way they make up for that cost, it's a hidden surcharge 
for all of us who have health insurance and that ultimately results in premiums being raised on average more than $1,000 per family per year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from, uh, from Illinois. The uh, Chair will now recognize himself for five minutes of questions. Eight out of ten physicians would reconsider their decision to practice medicine. A significant doctor shortage is on the horizon. Uh, naively, I suppose, uh, I want the smart kids in the class to be the ones to operate on me. I want the smart kids in the class to be the ones to put me to sleep, uh, more importantly, uh, to wake me up. One of the reasons, um, so I guess unless this administration plans to cross-train the 13,000 IRS agents as nephrologists and pediatricians and OBGYNs, uh, things look pretty bleak in this country. And one of the reasons I hear uh, that doctors are frustrated is uh, their fear of litigation and their um, requirement to practice defensive medicine. And they are in something of a Hobson's choice because uh, when my colleagues on the other side of the aisle ask them whether they practice defensive medicine, it is really a setup to admit that you engage in Medicaid or Medicare fraud, uh, which uh, is why I am not going to ask the physicians on this panel whether they practice defensive medicine. We all know that they do it. I heard the President in his State of the Union to vote about uh, one one-thousandth of one percent of the time he took in his State of the Union to mention tort reform. So, Mr. Pollack, uh, you didn't mention tort reform in your opening statement. Do you support caps on non-economic damages? No, I would not, we would not support that. We would support some changes that, well, deal, with, that you, deal with malpractice, me, but not, Mr. not artificial Mr. Pollack, caps. let me tell you the way this works. I ask the questions and then you answer them. Okay. So I want to give you a full answer. Well, I am going to ask you a series of questions. Good. And I want crisp answers, not filibusters, crisp answers. Do you support limits on non-economic damages? That is not a complicated question. It is not a multi-part question. Do you or do you not? Do not. Do you support limits on joint and several liability? Do not. Do you support a different standard of care for emergency medicine as opposed to medicine where a physician has a robust chart or file in front of them? I'm not sure I follow the question. Emergency medicine, where a physician is called upon in a matter of seconds to make a decision, they don't have the benefit of patient history or a lot of tests. Do you support a different standard of care for those physicians as opposed to ones who do have a full history in front of them? <laughs> Uh, no, not, not, not. So you uh, would hold physicians who have a matter of seconds to make a decision to exactly the same standard that you hold physicians who have treated patients for 20 years? Most physicians have access to uh, clinical guidelines as to what works. And I would expect that any physician, emergency physician or otherwise, would look at those guidelines, not necessarily felt, feel bound by those guidelines, but would use those guidelines in order to make a thoughtful decision for his or her patient. So the answer is no. And, um, I gave you a full answer no. to that question. <laughs> All right. Well, the answer was no. Do you support loser pays? I'm not sure I, I follow that. Loser pays. You file a lawsuit. The jury finds it frivolous with a special verdict form. Do you support a reversal? I think anyone who files a frivolous claim should pay physician costs. So you support loser pays? Uh, anyone who files a frivolous claim should pay physician costs. Do you know where the majority of the litigation comes from in this country, whether it is paying patients or non-paying patients? It comes from uh, paying patients. No, right? sir. It comes okay. from non-paying patients. I, I the majority I... of the litigation, the lawsuits filed, come from non-paying patients. I don't, I don't believe that. You can, I can't help what you believe. I can just help what the facts are. Dr. Collier, um, what should we be doing to incentivize the best and brightest to go into medicine and reverse the trend that 8 out of 10 would reconsider their decision to practice medicine 
And I don't know a single physician that would encourage his or her kids or grandkids to practice medicine. Let them be a doctor. Let them make the decision. Let them have a relationship with their patients and really do their, their specialty, their experience. That's what would make the difference. And it's the bureaucracy that is driving us crazy. Mr. Pollock, let me ask you, you, you twice made reference to free, which I find to be a fascinating word, free preventative care. Um, it, what's free about it? Does that mean the doctor donates his or her time and the, and the pharmaceutical company donates the drugs and the medical device company just donates it? When you say free, free preventative care, free contraception, well, what do you mean by free? Well, with free preventive care, it means that one's insurance policy will pay for that and how without will the, a deductible and without a copay. And how will the insurance company make sure that it doesn't go broke? It will pass the cost on to other people, right? By providing preventive care, it avoids much more costly and cumbersome services later on so that somebody does so not have So it is free in an spread. economic, from a futuristic economic sense, it is free. If you are asking free in terms of I'm dollars, just fascinated it, by will, the word free. It, it will save money in the long term because it means a problem will be diagnosed at an earlier stage and it means somebody will not need complex care later on, which is far more expensive. Uh, I am out of time. I will now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, since 2001, employer-sponsored health coverage for family premiums has more than doubled, crowding out other investments in human capital and innovation and placing coverage out of reach for more families. The ACA was designed to reform our system of health care delivery to incentivize high-quality care appropriately price services and fight waste, fraud, and abuse. In fact, the ACA contains almost every cost containment provision that policy analysts have considered and touted as effective in reducing the growth of health care spending. Uh, Mr. Pollack, do you believe that the provisions contained in the ACA to incentivize high quality care, appropriately priced services and, fate and fight waste, fraud and abuse are important to a robo robust, affordable health care system? I do, sir. And uh, Mr. Mr. Pollack, won't access to preventative care as designed by the ACA assist in controlling the cost of overall care as folks no longer have to use the emergency room for treatment of preventable health care problems. Mr. Clay, as, as, as you are inferring, care in an emergency room tends to be the most expensive care possible. And when it occurs, it normally occurs when somebody has actually had a disease spread and uh, the illness now needs heroic treatment. So I do believe that if we can avoid that, it is both good medicine and it is more cost-effective medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, today and tomorrow the uh, Republican majority will try for the 31st time this Congress to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but what is their alternative? They have none. They have no solution to continued growth in health care spending and have offered no comprehensive approach to deal with the systemic causes of growth in health care spending. You know, research has shown that the uninsured are more likely to delay or forego needed medical care than insured individuals. As a result, the uninsured are more likely to be hospitalized for avoidable medical condition which increases overall health care costs for everyone. The CBO believes that the Affordable Care Act will expand coverage to 32 million Americans, with approximately 19 million Americans benefiting from premium assistance credits for the purchase of private health insurance. Uh, Mr. Pollack, as you, as you know, 
um, the, this vote will, will not repeal the Affordable Care Act, uh, but it signals what would happen if Republicans were to win the, win the uh, White House, the Senate, and hold on to the House. Uh, Mr. Pollack, have, have the Republicans offered a viable plan to ensure the uninsured and improve health outcomes while containing the very problematic increase in health care cost? Well, Mr. Clay, at the outset of this debate, in the first of the 31 different efforts to repeal the statute, we heard a lot about repeal and replace. Since that time, we have only heard repeal, 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 and precious little with respect to replace. And without the protections and expanded el eligibility made possible by the ACA, how else do we guarantee that poor and working class Americans access cost-effective primary care services? Well, we do this not just by expanding Medicaid, and I take issue with uh, my fellow panelists who criticize the program, but one of the key ways we do it is by improving private health insurance, and we make it more affordable by providing tax credit subsidies so that people can afford it. Uh, the chairman of the committee talked about a family with $50,000 in income. That family will receive huge tax credit subsidies to make health coverage affordable. If we repeal the Affordable Care Act, not only will health coverage be unaffordable, but there will be a tax increase experienced by those middle class families. There we go again, beating up on the little guys. Thank you so much, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I do thank the panel for coming today and giving us their insight. I also would like to thank uh, some of the noncommittee members, my physician colleagues that have joined us today. Uh, you have uh, six members of the Doctors Caucus sitting before you on the panel today. Uh, we have 15 physicians in Congress now and three in the Senate. Uh, we make up a combined uh, 600 years of total experience in health care. And uh, I would say that there, I think I can say for all of us sitting here, not a single one of us went to medical school thinking that one day we would be sitting in Congress. We went into medicine because we want to help people. And my colleagues are joining me here today because they want to talk about this important issue. Despite what Mr. Pollack uh, said about the, the numerous groups that are in support of the health care law, I think that uh, there are several doctors here and doctors across the country that clearly oppose it, and I think there's patients across the country that oppose it. This was evident by the fact that 63 percent of the people were opposed to this health care law when it was passed. And that, that continues to be the case. The majority of the people don't want it. So to sit here and say that we should keep it uh, is, is disingenuous. And now, uh, with the Supreme Court ruling saying that uh, we will all be taxed, clearly the President has broken his promise about not raising taxes on the middle class with this enormous tax. And it also cuts and hurts Medicare. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm tired of these attacks as a physician because we care about patients having good access to care, and I don't think there's a physician on the panel that thinks that this will control cost or improve the quality of care, and it certainly is going to hinder the doctor-patient relationship. Doctors, would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, all the doctors uh, are nodding. And uh, Mr. Pollack, you said that this is going to make health care more affordable. How do you justify that when the cost, as Ms. Pipes had stated, has doubled since President Obama uh, initially said $800 billion has gone to $1.7 trillion. How do you justify that? Well, first of all, I want to just correct one thing. The, the Chief Justice did not say that this is going to be a broad tax. In fact, if you read his opinion, his opinion makes clear that only about 1.3 percent of the American public would face this tax penalty. So he you cited, don't think he cited don't think in it's a his tax. I thought he, it was clearly he, a tax, he, sir. Uh, you may call now, are, are the businesses? I'm not disputing the language of okay. tax or penalty. That's not the purpose of what I'm saying. But what you're what how is you, it making it more affordable? I mean, how is it more affordable? You say it's more affordable. Ms. Pipes, I'll give you a chance too to to debate this. Well, it makes it more affordable because it provides huge tax credit subsidies 
so that people can afford private health coverage. And tens of Who's going to pay for the subsidies? Where does that come from? Taxes? Uh, we don't have free, as, as the Chairman said, we don't have free in this country. You said it reduces costs. That isn't free, and it's not reducing costs. No, there, there are some savings and efficiencies created in the Affordable Care Act. I'll give you an example. Do you think Medicaid is, is uh, efficient, cost I, efficient? Yes, it well, is. Is, congressional Medi budget is Medicare off, congressional, congressional Budget Office made clear during the debate that that would be the most efficient way to expand coverage to people who don't have it. Ms. Pipes, do you think uh, Medicaid is affordable or is this law affordable? Uh, no, as I said, the CBO said $1.76 trillion. Uh, many economists, myself included, believe that in 2014, the decade 2014 to 2024, this law will cost about $2.6 trillion because of the cost drivers, the exchanges, the individual mandate, the employer mandate, the ending of price discrimination based on preexisting conditions. It is going to be very, very expensive. On the issue of Medicaid and Medicare, the um, Congressional Budget Office and the Medicare trustees have shown that by 20, the Medicare trustees say by 2024, Medicare will cost about $1 trillion, almost double what it is today, Medicaid $800 billion, and these programs will be bankrupt. We need to make changes so that the people that do need Medicare and Medicaid have access. But interestingly, under the Affordable Care Act, Medicare is being cut by $500 billion over the decade to add those 18 million people to Medicaid. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Collier, do you have anything to add? Actually, let me uh, be specific. Uh, let's talk about the bureaucracy. What has happened with Obamacare? How much of your time is spent on bureaucracy versus medicine? Two-thirds of my, of my staff are dealing with the bureaucracy uh, aspect of it. We are even seeing this in State government. We have we've put together health reforms that are really going to save money and actually reverse a lot of, out, a lot of problems and outcomes, and it is going to take us months to actually get that through the bureaucracy. Is there anything affordable about that? No. Our, our State has had tremendous financial problems. All right. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Ms. Holmes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in our discussions about doctor-patient relationships, I am sure we all agree uh, that we would want most patients to have a doctor. Um, and let us stipulate for the record that the cost of health care will go up. The question is, Costs compared under the Affordable Health Care Act compared to no Affordable Health Care Act. So throwing out trillions of dollars will get you nowhere unless we have a, 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 a comparison to make, uh, and one that is as credible as the CBO's comparison, I might add. Um, it may be, uh, Dr. Lieutenant Governor Collier, you may be the appropriate person for this question. Uh, because you s serve in, in both roles. I don't know if the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Kansas has an operational role as well, but let me ask you this question because you may be uh, most familiar with it. Um, some, a few governors have said that they will not accept 100 percent Medicaid funding going down <clears throat> gradually to 90 percent uh, to fund uh, working class and working poor people who are now included under Medicaid and the Affordable Health Care uh, Act. Uh, is Kansas, by the way, one of those states that has as it yet made a decision? No. We, ha we are in the midst of a major Medicaid reform, and we are trying to make it so that it is much more responsive to patients. We have got an election coming up. The Governor has said we need to change the system, and we are going to make a decision afterwards. Well, I appreciate that you are thinking it through rather than just responding the day after the Supreme Court decision. But, but I have a, a question about uh, where these people, these uh, many of them, most of them indeed, working people, uh, went before and will now go. Where they went before, of course, was to the cost costliest doctors, and those were the doctors in the emergency room, where, where in fact they cost the State and the Federal Government five and six times what they would cost if they had a medical home. My concern is with hospitals. Hospitals in big cities like my own, and particularly hospitals in uh, rural areas, uh, can hospitals uh, survive 
if uh, these patients are thrown back with no, uh, what, 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 what it looks like to be now, no uncompensated care. So, it, you know, you do the charity care, and it falls back mostly on the state. It fall back mostly on the state. It fell back mostly on the state before, but there was a little something that uh, the federal government gave for uncompensated care. Again, uh, what are your hospitals saying about the effect on them uh, if these patients are thrown back into their emergency rooms at uh, a greater cost to the state and? And uh, uh, I suppose not to the federal government, since they won't be on Medicaid. Yeah, actually, we are creating a system that it does exist. The majority of people without insurance don't end up in the emergency room. They get their care through a variety of clinics, through their private physician in the state of Kansas. We have a number of federally qualified health clinics, for example, with very low cost. Uh, yeah, we all yeah. have those. And, and we all have those. But they are a really important safety net. But there are some other solutions that we are And they are largely, often largely federally funded as well. And also state funded. And we are also able to create incentives for doctors and people to take care of people in their own community. And it is giving the states, the individual states, the opportunity to make these solutions. That is what is so important. Well, I can understand that, Dr. Lieutenant Collier. Uh, I just hope that in the, in the process, uh, the State will consult with the hospitals, uh, because they may be one of the victims in all of the, the play back and forth. We, we, we don't know. But I appreciate the, the approach you are taking that, that looks at all the factors involved. Um, may I ask a, a question of, of you, Mr. Pollack? I was astounded by the number, almost 16 million Americans. Um, have uh, non-elderly now have what what, what are called pre-existing conditions. Um, this is a, a frightening number, one in five Americans. Uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, uh, where would where were these people receiving uh, treatment? Were they receiving treatment? Well, they they were uninsured by and large because. People with preexisting conditions, a child with asthma or diabetes, could not get health insurance coverage from an insurer. Now that the Affordable Care Act, with respect to that aspect of the law, is in effect for children, those children are now getting coverage and they are getting care. In 2014, for adults, that protection will be extended. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, is, it a, is there a way other than a, the, the way that the Affordable Health Act has found putting as many people in the pool as possible. Is there a way to provide health insurance in an affordable fashion for people with preexisting conditions? Well, the best answer to that question is some states have established high-risk pools. And high-risk pools are a substitute. But the problem is when you have a pool composed completely of people who have illnesses and health conditions, the premium costs per person skyrocket. And that is why you want to integrate them into private insurance uh, pools that include healthy and young people along with sicker and older people. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady from the District of Columbia. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. You know, I would like to uh, run a clip first uh, um, and have you watch this clip, and I want to get some um, your opinion. And that means that no matter how we reform health care, we will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. No one will take it away, no matter what. My view is that health care reform should be guided by a simple principle. Fix what's broken and build on what works. And that's what we intend to do. If we do that, we can build a health care system that allows you to be physicians instead of administrators and accountants. 
Dr. Collier, let me give your opinion to that uh, comment. And I thought the backdrop was very interesting that was at the AMA. In Kansas, you will not be able to keep your more affordable plan under the ACA. We have developed a wide variety of health insurance plans and opportunities there, health insurance accounts, a whole variety of things. And we can expand those and do that. We have now got a one-size-fits-all that is much more expensive than what we have in the, in the State of Kansas. It may work in other States, but it is not for us. How about you, Dr. Armstrong? Well, that is obviously completely false. And to, for the President to say that we are going to allow doctors to not be bureaucrats anymore, I mean, that is when you look at what has been done so far, we have 12,000 pages of regulations uh, that we don't even know what they say. How can that possibly not uh, allow doctors to be bureaucrats? That is just ridiculous. Those two statements that he made, if you like your doctor, you can keep him. If you like your plan, you can keep it. It is obvious now that that is just false. That is just completely false. That was the sales pitch to the American Medical Association. And I might um, remind everyone that the American Medical Association receives uh, 80 to $100 million a year from their sale of the uh, um, CPT coding books and CPT licensing. Um, so they have a a small amount of financial incentive to go along with whatever CMS thinks is a good idea. Can I ask you a real question to interject there? What percentage of the physicians in the country do they represent? Latest uh, numbers are that approximately 10 percent of actively practicing physicians belong to the American Medical Association. I find that interesting. I'm, you know, I'm a dentist, and the American Dental Association represents over 70 percent of the dentists across the country. In 1962, when Dr. Ed Annis uh, gave his uh, famous talk uh, against Medicare at Madison Square Garden, the American Medical Association represented 70 percent of American doctors. Mm -hmm. Dr. Novak, I want to get your opinion. Well, it is certainly not the case. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the protection against so-called preexisting conditions for children mean that in at least 34 states it is almost impossible to get a child-only policy. If you are a member of at least two branches of the SEIU in New York State and you have a child who is insured, you didn't get to keep what you have, because in response to this they dropped all child policies. Uh, if you had uh, certain health care policies in the Midwest with a company that had about 900,000 members, they just stopped offering health insurance entirely. Uh, so it, people are not keeping what they have. Their costs are going through the roof. Uh, ultimately, if the goal was to provide more accessible care for the people who need it at a more affordable rate, what I have seen in the past two years is that we are going in exactly the opposite direction. So, I mean, I just had two health care forums on uh, fr uh, Friday, and, I mean, the uproar is in immense. I'm, you know, we are from Arizona, you know, lots of it, there are rural uh, part, uh, parts. We are we're, we're dumping so many more patients into the Medicaid, and by the way, he said we are going to work on things that actually work. Um, the last time I looked at Medicaid, it doesn't really work. Uh. I mean, Arizona's Medicaid system, as people know, we were the, Arizona was the last state to join Medicaid in 1982, came in under a waiver, and has always existed, always existed in a managed care system. And even that, the system is basically at its breaking point. Uh, there was a $1 billion shortfall. Uh, in the last year or two at the legislature to try to cover Medicaid. Uh, the system just isn't working. Uh, the number of cuts to services, because that is really the only option that the uh, system has. So now if you are on Medicaid in Arizona, you can't get durable medical equipment. So I can't put my patients in certain kinds of uh, boots to help them get around better. They have to be in a cast or nothing, which is a big problem for a lot of the working folks I take care of. Uh, you can no longer see a podiatrist if you are on Medicaid in the State of Arizona. So uh, if you have diabetes and you need regular foot care and you are on Medicaid, you are out of luck because the system simply doesn't cover it. I just real quick uh, leverage here, but um, there are groups that are exempted from Obamacare, are there not? Uh, well, One we are very familiar with, the Native Americans? Well, there are you know, all sorts of different waivers. There were things that were put into the law. But the real problem, and I think for speaking from the provider side and from the policy side and from the uh, government side, is that the application of the law is turning out to be completely arbitrary. 
it would be one thing if for those of us who are involved in the practice of medicine could actually count on the letter of the law and try to make adaptations. But what we have seen with the nearly 2,000 waivers uh, affecting over 4 million Americans who won't get certain benefits, if we look to the fact that actually snuck into the law was that if you were in a self-funded insurance plan, which is over 100 million Americans, 60 percent of all people with commercial insurance, you will never get the benefits of the essential health benefit package that uh, the President and the Democrats said was an urgent moral imperative because they were exempted from that entirely. Uh, so we are finding complete arbitrariness in the application, and that is making it ultimately harder for people to get care. And I find it real interesting that the, the, the group of people that have had government-dictated health care the longest are rebelling uh, enormously across the board to self-determination type plans. So thank you. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. The Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, distinguished physician, Dr. Gingrey. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I want to thank you and, and, and members on both sides of the aisle to, for extending us this courtesy to be guests uh, today and indeed to ask some questions. Uh, let me real quickly uh, uh, turn to Dr. Novak. Uh, Obamacare does not address the problems of most Americans who have very low expected health care expenditures. According to the Agency for Health Care Quality Research, and I think you talked about this in your testimony, the bottom 70 percent of health care users in this country, that is about 224 million Americans, spend only, I think you said, 11 percent of the health care dollars are about 290 billion out of 2.7 trillion. In your testimony, you stated that Obamacare harms these 224 million Americans that are very low utilized. Why? Number one, costs are going up. Uh, that is number one. Number two is the creation of all of these new bureau bureaucracies and boards and the effort to shove these people who are just occasional users of health care into very complicated medical home models that make it harder to get access to specialty care when that may be what they need just to get in and get out, uh, that makes the system more difficult to navigate. Uh, it makes this, the process of going to the doctor a less pleasant experience. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, turning to Dr. Uh, Collier, Lieutenant Governor uh, Collier, you talked about what you and Dr. Uh, what Governor Brownback have done in the State of Kansas in regard to the Medicaid program. So I want to focus in real quickly uh, this question to you. You spoke about the off-ramp, uh, I think you used that phrase, that off-ramp of getting people off of Medicaid into private insurance. Uh, you know, part of PAPACA, uh, the Affordable Care Act, has this maintenance, maintenance of effort requirement under Medicaid for at least the next uh, two or three years uh, before the expansion kicks in, the additional 20 million people. Uh, and as I understand that uh, maintenance of effort, it would prevent you and Governor Brownback and Governor Deal of the State of Georgia and, and, and uh, uh, folks that are working on trying to solve their Medicaid problem in a State-based way, uh, the crucibles of innovation, uh, that you couldn't even look at your roles and determine if many people in Kansas uh, who two years ago were eligible for Medicaid, but maybe today they are not. Indeed, maybe they are not even illegal, not even legal citizens, uh, legal residents of this country. But more importantly, from the economic standpoint, they are not eligible. Uh, isn't this a tremendous problem for you to get these folks onto that off-ramp, as you describe? Well, we, we want to give people the opportunity to get back into stable commercial insurance that, that they can control, that is very portable, that, that they can take with them. Maintenance of effort does decrease that. But part of the problem with the maintenance of effort is not just that people are in, it is being really interpreted in very broad ways. The previous governor asked for an, just a small increase in the premiums that were paid by certain CHIP yeah. uh, members, and instead of a, uh, you know, a few dollars, there was just a few cents. Yeah. Uh, so sorry. essentially what you are saying is you have got handcuffs on you that prevent you from doing some of these things in an innovative way to make sure that the dollars get to the people that need them the most on the Medicaid program. Let me uh, utilize, Mr. Chairman, the remaining portion of my time. Uh, to uh, talk to and ask questions of Dr. Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong, uh, and thank you for wearing that white coat. That means a lot, believe me, to the weak physician members that are sitting up here asking you the questions. On page 78 of Public Law 
111, 148, otherwise known as PAPACA, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. There is a section entitled Enhancing Patient Safety. Let me read you the section. Beginning on January 1, 2015, a qualified health plan, otherwise known as an insurance company, may contract with a health care provider only if they implement mechanisms to improve health care quality as defined by the Secretary, indeed by regulation. My concern is that nowhere in the many pages of Obamacare is the word quality defined. So I am interested in the thoughts of the panelists. If Obamacare gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the power to invalidate the private business contracts that providers need to stay in business, in other words, they have to be on the panel, uh, what type of authority does that give the Secretary to direct how providers deliver care and practice medicine? Dr. Armstrong, uh, in your testimony you cite the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force and its findings that recommend against mammography screenings for women below the age of 50. I am an OBGYN, 26 years in practice. I do not believe that such a recommendation is the kind of personalized medicine that my patients deserve. Each patient is different, and therefore I would probably not adhere to this bureaucratic directive from Secretary Sibelius or any other Secretary of Health and Human Services. I would listen to my specialty society, the American College of OBGYN. So tell me, real quickly, I know I am a little out of time, tell me, Dr. Armstrong, could the Secretary of Health and Human Services literally drive me or any other practitioner out of business under the authority given to her to enhance patient safety? Yes. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Florida. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from uh, Michigan, the distinguished Dr. Beneshek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the privilege of being here on this uh, committee this, this morning. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, um, you have been in practice for a long time. What is the worst feature of practicing uh, medicine today? Probably the risk of, of, of a malpractice suit, if you had to add, you know, say what the worst risk is. But there are many, but we could start there. Did, did the Affordable Care Act do anything to address this problem? Essentially, no. There was money in it to uh, fund state demonst demonstration projects um, for looking at different alternatives to tort reform, but there were some strings attached to that money that made it very difficult for states to do it. For instance, if your State proposed a cap on non-economic damages, you couldn't get the demonstration money. All right. Uh, Dr. Novak, what, what do you think is the, is the most difficult uh, aspect of practicing medicine today? I think, as, as was alluded to earlier, the challenge is that in our practice, where we have nine providers, uh, we have three times that many allied health personnel. So as opposed to being able to devote the, the resources to try to provide as comprehensive and as widespread care as possible, uh, we have large expending of our resources on things that really have very little to do with patient care. Is, is the Affordable Care Act improving that situation, then? Uh, thus far, it has made it significantly worse. Since regulations, new regulations seem to appear every week, uh, since we have an environment now where the other parties in health care are seeking to take huge steps to really take ownership over these huge chunks of money. Uh, in large part, we can look at the potential for the $900 billion in Medicaid spending that the CBO anticipates over the next 10 years and the $800 billion in direct insurance company subsidies. Uh, the problem there is that patients and families cease to become patients and families and become entities where if you can get them under your umbrella, you then get those Federal dollars. Uh, that has very little to do with patient care. Yeah, I, you know, on taking care of patients and seeing uh, what is happening with medicine now with the Affordable Care Act and just the third party payer system, you know, it concerns me that it seems that the physicians are working less and less for the patient and more and more for some uh, other bureaucracy which is going to dictate the form of, of care that they give to those patients. Uh, you know, my feeling is that uh, the, you know, the doctor-patient relationship should be one where the patient is in control of the situation. Um, do you think, Dr. Armstrong, do you think that patients um, can be trusted to take care of their own health care, or do you think that they need the Affordable Care Act to 
uh, you know, guide their, their care for them? I think there are many concrete examples that show that patients can be um, uh, excellent consumers in healthcare markets. Well, give, give us one example. Well, for instance, in Indiana, with the Healthy Indiana Plan that uh, has been established by Dr. Mitch, uh, Governor Mitch Daniels, I mean, under Medicaid, uh, patients are given these power accounts and they have to make their own decisions, similar to a health savings account, about where the money goes. And they have actually shown that they have reduced their health care spending but not affected outcomes. And so what they have reduced the health care spending by up to 30 percent but not affected their health care outcomes. That is just one thing. This has also been done in private in industry and in private contracts uh, uh, and could continue to be uh, advocated in other areas. Uh, Dr. Collier, do you have any, any comments in that, in that vein? Yes. I think there, there are lots of opportunities where patients can make their own choices um, and they can work with their doctor for good solutions. You know, for example, if you empower a patient to, you know, you are empowering the patient we can oftentimes do their procedure in the office rather than under certain rules it would only be paid for only if you do it in the hospital setting. Those are common sorts of problems. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Novak, uh, who do you think should be in charge of the health care decisions, the doctors and patients or, or the bureaucrats? I think patients and families in conjunction with the treating physicians and other health care personnel. Does the Affordable Care Act encourage that? Uh, it moves it in the opposite direction. As I mentioned, when you create 150 plus new bureaucracies, when you manage to have 13,000 pages of regulations, and that is just the tip of the iceberg, on top of the 130,000 pages of regulations that Medicare has created since 1965, and have a health exchange network that is likely to adopt nearly wholesale the Medicare regulations, then foisting that on the patient population and the providers, uh, you create an environment where the decision makers and ultimately the payers uh, are not patients and families, but people far removed. And as I mentioned in the testimony, the ultimate reality will become that the people who provide care, whether it is physicians, nurses, other people, are going to be more responsive to the decision makers rather than patients. And I just don't see, after 24 years of taking care of patients in almost every setting, uh, how that is good for patient care. Well, thank you, Dr. Novak. I certainly agree with you. Uh, my time is up. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Michigan. The Chair will now recognize the distinguished general from Louisiana, Dr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again for uh, having us on uh, as guests for the panel. I want to I bring the panel's attention to this card here. Now, this, uh, you may not be able to see it from there, so I will explain to you what it is. This is my health care card. This is Blue Cross Blue Shield. Despite what you may read on the Internet, I actually pay 28 percent of my premium, and it is a private insurance plan. This is my on-ramp into the health care system. This is my key in the door. Now, the ranking member, Mr. Davis, made a comment a moment ago that sort of tweaked my ear. He said that the Obamacare would give access to care to 30 million more Americans. And therein lies the problem. There is a tremendous myth that just because you have a card that entitles you to coverage that you actually have access to care. Now, let's go to you, Ms. Pipes. You made a, a really good point, very moving uh, story about your mom. And I am sure some would like to say that that was an exception. But I have heard many stories like that as well in Canada where people had cancer, never got the treatment that they needed. And in fact, if you look at the statistics, death rates from prostate cancer, death rates from breast cancer in both Great Britain and Canada, where there is supposed to be 100 percent coverage, everybody carries a card, but yet the death rates as a result of late diagnosis and also inadequate treatment are much higher in those countries. So I would love to hear your response on this differential between carrying a card that says you are covered and the actual access to care. Thank you. Yes. Um, in in the, the United States ranks um, um, number one in 13 of the 16 most uh, prominent cancers, breast cancer, um, colon cancer, uh, mammography. So we do extremely well compared to uh, Canada. In terms of positive outcomes. Yes. Right. At five years, uh, survi five years survival rates. Right. 
Um, in a country like Canada, the Fraser Institute's new study on hospital um, waiting lists, the um, average wait today in Canada from seeing a specialist to getting treatment by a specialist is 9.5 weeks, the highest since they started recording wait times, and it is up from 9.3. The average wait from seeing a primary care doctor to getting treatment by a specialist is 19 weeks, almost five months. In a Supreme Court case in, in Canada, Madam Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, in looking at the, the province of Quebec and denied care, she said, access to a waiting list is not access to health care. And so, you know, in, the, in a country like Britain and Canada, you do have these long waits. You read stories in the press all the time. As my friend, the former head of the Canadian Medical Association, who runs an illegal orthopedic clinic in Vancouver, said a, a family can get a hip replacement for their dog in less than two weeks, and for their family the average wait is two years. I believe unless this act is repealed and replaced with solutions that empower doctors and patients, we will face the same kind of ration care and long waits in America. Now, there are those that would say, well, look, we don't have the single-payer system that they have there, therefore that is not going to be a problem here. But I would take everyone back to the health care debate. Many on the other side of the aisle, many Democrats, actually wished for, wanted, and pushed for a single-payer, and in fact, uh, hope uh, through, and this is their words, not mine, hope that this evolves into that. So would it be fair to say that there is something different about the government takeover of health care under Obamacare and single payer when it comes to access to care? Well, as the late Senator Ted Kennedy used to say, his goal was Medicare for all, which is a single payer system. Um, I believe, as you say, there was no public option in the Senate bill or in the final bill, but we have already seen um, Congressman Jim McDermott from Washington State introducing a single-payer bill. We have seen some of the states. Uh, Vermont has uh, Governor Shumlin has a single-payer bill. I think, you know, ultimately, private insurers are going to be crowded out because they are not going to be able to offer insurance at the rates that they have to with the essential uh, benefit plan. So, and even Howard Dean the other day, who said he was against the individual mandate, has been pushing for a single payer. And so if we don't get an off-ramp, we are on um, the road to serfdom with a single payer system. I truly, I truly believe and I, I, I think it is going to happen. I only have a few moments. Dr. Novak, Dr. Armstrong, uh, would you like to weigh in? I agree with Sally. Yeah, access versus uh, There's, uh, There coverage. are multiple studies showing that people on Medicaid do not necessarily have any better access to certain kinds of care than people with no insurance at all. And I would just add to that, since you brought up Medicaid real quickly, I am a physician, see Medicaid patients all the time. The reimbursement levels, of course, are very low in Medicaid. They are going lower on Medicare. And so, um, uh, we have a lot of people in this country, a lot of people in my state of Louisiana, who walk around with a Medicaid card and now a Medicare card, and they ring up the doctor's office and they are told that they don't have access. Now, some would say, well, that is an arbitrary decision. No. Physicians all over this country are saying, we are closing our office down. We are going to have to work in an emergency room. I am going to have to do something else as an occupation because I can't survive. I can't make payroll as a doctor because of the low reimbursement rates. So where do these people end up going? They end up going to the emergency room, which the other side of the aisle would be the first to tell you is where the, the care is most expensive. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Louisiana. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the distinguished physician, Dr. Harris. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee for allowing uh, the uh, members of the Physicians Caucus to participate. Uh, Mr. Pollack, I am a physician who has always depended on the Conscience Clause protection in my practice. Does Families USA support the HHS mandate that includes abortifacients and sterilizations and that is now the subject of lawsuits claiming infringement of religious freedom? Families USA does support. Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Uh, Dr. Novak, thanks. It is simple. It is yes or no. So you support the, uh, that, that uh, uh, we that, support that the mandate. preventive care services sure. in okay. the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, and uh, that is what I needed to know. Uh, Dr. Novak, do you think the average American senior understands that to make Obamacare work, 
you are cutting $500 billion out of Medicare over the next 10 years, plus $300 billion in SGR scheduled cuts, $800 billion cut out of senior health care uh, funding. Do you think the average senior understands that? What, what I am seeing, both in my practice and doing some of the work I do around the country, is seniors recognizing that when they call to try to find a physician, they are not finding doctors who are taking Medicare patients. Do you think and Obamacare a, will make that worse or better? It, it will make it worse. As you mentioned, the, the numbers which were cooked, which of course in our business, uh, if you could cook your anesthesia <laughs> concoctions with the I'd same I would live in a serious, courtroom all my life yes, if I did with that. With seriousness. So the, the supposed savings, of course, is predicated on these $300 billion in SGR payments, including a 30 percent cut sure. in January of next year. Sure. And if we know that that's effect, not feasible. We will uh, really significantly adversely impact access to care. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pipes, we heard a lot about free preventive care. So I was giving a town hall a couple months ago, and two physicians stand up in the back and go, you know, we work in uh, federally qualified health centers, and they told me that the free flu vaccine they get paid over $200 by the, from the Federal Government for the free flu vaccine that people get when you can walk down to the Rite Aid or Walgreens and get it for $39.95. Now, Ms. Pike, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't this, in, in very short answer, doesn't this indicate that, in fact, free preventive care is not free? And not only that, when the Federal Government delivers it, it can cost five or six times as much as the private sector? Yes, and uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Dr. Collier, Lieutenant Governor. Why would you possibly recommend to your governor to participate in Medicaid, the expansion from 100 to 133 percent, when you know that if you choose not to, every one of those patients will be covered under a Federal health exchange at no cost to your State, no administrative cost, no cost at all? And you see, as the chairman pointed out, and, and the, the, uh, the congressman from Louisiana, you know, in Texas right now, only 31 percent of physicians will take a Medicaid patient, but a whole lot more will take a private patient. And in fact, Mr. Pollack said, well, you know, under this plan, you get a private uh, health insurance plan. Why would any governor possibly do it to those people, those poor people who we heard about, you know, from the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, those poor working people who we heard about from the ranking member? Why would you foist Medicaid on them when their option under affordable care is a federally subsidized health exchange plan. Well, I understand that. But given the scenario, any governor who does this to their, to their poor people, to their people in that 100, 133 who opt to expand Medicaid, ought to talk to some of the docs about what I urge everyone listening. Call up your doc and ask them if they take Medicaid, and then decide whether you would want to be on Medicaid or not. Ms. Pipes, we heard Mr. Pollack say that, quote, some states have high-risk pools. Don't 35 states have high-risk pools? Yes, they do. Thank you very much. I just, just want to clarify that, in fact, the vast majority of Americans are already covered under preexisting conditions in high-risk. Mr. Pollack, it's, it's a fact. That's how many have it, including Maryland. I'm not asking you a question. These are all Ms. very Mr. small. Mr. Pollack, I'm not asking pool. you a question. Listen to what the chairman, admo how he admonished you. You are to, to answer a question when I ask you. I didn't ask you the question. You already made the statement that some states, we understand that to you, 35 of 50 is just some. Ms. Pipes, I'm an obstetric anesthesiologist. I spent my life delivering health care to women. I watched the cesarean section rate go from 18 when I started in 1980 to 35 now. That's the C-section rate. Just for all of you young ladies in the audience, you are twice as likely now to have a cesarean section as you would have been when I started my practice 30 years ago. You can't find an experienced OB who's been, who's been doing it for 30 years to deliver your baby anymore. They all gave it up. You get the inexperienced, well-intended young physicians because the experienced OBs have given up, because of lack of tort reform, you have a doubling of the cesarean section rate. Right? Any young ladies think that's better health care? Raise your hand. I don't think so. Does this Affordable Care Act do anything at all to address a rising cesarean section rate or the fact that experienced obstetricians are leaving the field? No, and tort reform is one of the things. We have seen the, the OBGYNs in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, the states that have Nevada that have the highest um, med mal insurance rates. The, the decline in OBGYNs has been very uh, significant. And who does that hurt? It hurts 
young, all women who are of childbearing age. It hurts age. women. I suggest, Mr. Pollack, you take that information back to your group that opposes tort reform. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman from Maryland. On behalf of all the panelists, uh, we want to thank our uh, distinguished panel of witnesses. I, could I just uh, clarify? I, I was mentioned in terms of something that I said, and I don't think I really said that. Sure. So, Doctor, you, you implied that I su suggested that because individuals had access to insurance, they had access to care. I have been in this business much too long to have not understood that insurance does not necessarily mean access to care. We will have the, many will the gentleman serious, let me just finish and then. We, we, we have serious manpower shortage areas. We have areas where there are no physicians. We have areas where there are no facilities. And so access to insurance means that you have a way to pay for care. It does not necessarily mean that the care, and I am amazed when I hear individuals suggest that we are going to put such a burden on the health care delivery system. It just depends on how you look at it. If you are a young person who want to become a physician or who want to become a nurse, it creates a tremendous opportunity for you to go to medical school, <laughs> to go and be trained so that you can provide care for these millions of people who don't have any. I just wanted to clear that up. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, could I correct the record on a, a factual matter? Uh, yes, the General Labor and District of Columbia can, but I think in fairness I should give the gentleman from Louisiana a chance to respond since he attempted to do so, yeah. and then I will recognize the General Labor and District of Columbia yeah. and anyone else who wants to come. Sure. Uh, well, let me. Uh, say parenthetically that a study just came out today that I believe 83 percent of physicians, uh, when asked, when polled, this was a survey, a scientific survey, said they are reconsidering their occupation. So, uh, and I can tell you that I get questions a lot from medical students who ask me, did they do the right thing? So, uh, again, I would just say to the gentleman that right now Obamacare means for health care workers a very uncertain future. Yes, they do want to take care of patients, insured or not, but they see a very dark cloud ahead of them. But to respond to your statement, uh, yes, sir, you did say access to care. That is the actual term. And I am sure we could pull it up in the transcript if we need to. And why that is important is because that is a common myth. Whether or not the gentleman meant it or not is beside the point. The point I needed to make with that is that Americans are getting that message that once you get that card, that means that you go into the health care system and you are just going to be taken care of. And that is the whole point. Half of the additionally covered Americans under Obamacare, and this is by Democrat numbers, not mine. I think fewer are going to be covered than the 30 million that are claimed. But half of them will be covered under Medicaid. And you just heard the gentleman from Maryland say, that very few doctors accept Medicaid, not because they don't want to accept Medicaid, because they can't afford to accept Medicaid. If we don't deal with the cost realities that go with uh, malpractice insurance and all of that, the access problem is going to only get worse. So uh, I think that is something we need to leave with today, that just because you have a car, just because you are in a system, does not mean you have access. And I yield back. I would like the gentleman from Louisiana, and I would recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on, on the matter of the uh, health people on, uh, who would receive uh, Medicaid uh, under the Affordable Health Care Act, going to the exchange, you go to the exchange, it seems you have some cash to pay for the health care in the exchange. These are people above the limit of Medicaid, but uh, unable to pay for health insurance, and that question is the payment for health insurance and the high risk pool. Uh, I'm sorry, the the um, uh, the exchange will not help those people, which is why they were included in in Medicaid for pre-existing for those with pre-existing uh, conditions going to the high risk pool. 
The high-risk pool is anything but affordable. It should be called the unaffordable high-risk pool because uh, clustered there are all of those who have sought refuge there, and therefore it becomes unaffordable for almost everyone who would want access, who had the diabetes and can't find a podiatrist. I guess what he couldn't find if he weren't on Medicaid at all. Uh, so the problem, ha the, the system has its faults. But, but it, it, it certainly doesn't have the faults that the present system, le which leads, leaves out of, of it those with preexisting uh, conditions and people who simply cannot afford uh, health care. Thank the general lady from the District of Columbia. Anything else for the good of the order? The gentleman from Maryland? Thank you very much. Well, just to, uh, I, I don't know what preexisting pools and high risk pools cover in other states, but in Maryland it's very affordable. It's funded by a small tax on hospital admissions. And in fact, the, uh, when we started it, the premiums were $300, 300 and something a month for someone with a preexisting condition. That's pretty darn affordable for individual insurance. And just to correct, I was talking about in my comments about Medicaid, the 100 to 133 percent of Federal poverty level would be 100 percent covered under the, under the exchanges. Higher up, you need cash. But at that level, 100 percent coverage. So that was my point, just in that narrow range. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank uh, my colleagues on both sides. And again, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank our distinguished panel of witnesses for taking time from their busy schedules to appear before us today. With that, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>